Okay, so we have a couple different issues, a couple different things on here that we're going to go through. Um, just you know, regarding histories of modules and TC39, um, there's actually a few people on this call who have more experience and history with this than I do. Um, so um, for the purpose of you know, this particular discussion, um, I think that it might make sense to, oh, wait, oh geez, I closed the window, <laughs> hold on one second. Um, I think it may make sense for the, for the purpose of this discussion to not follow the general cue, and I'd be okay with people just kind of interrupting me as I go if there's things to expand upon or things that I'm getting wrong. Um, does anyone have a problem with that? Okay, I will take the silence there to mean that no one has a problem with, you know, being a little, a little more informal with uh, the collaboration. So as we go, I may call on um, the room just to add context or alternatively, um, you know, just kind of like let me know if you have something to add. So history of modules on the TC39. Um, if I recall, before we get into the intro introduction ES6, um, I'm just checking. Guy, you're still on the call. You had brought up um, something that was like kind of prior art before this. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's that last bullet point there at the moment. Uh, so I, I believe that was sort of sketches that were put together during the harmony planning phase that sort of led into ES 2015. Um, but I mean, yeah, it's it. <laughs> It goes back quite a way, these discussions. Um, but this was never anything very formal. Um, so there's no need to really worry too much about it, I don't think, uh, unless you want me to give a bit more background. No, it's OK. Um, I think that's fine. This is just you know some prior art that's good to know about. As you can see, we're in the Wayback Machine. So this is, this, you know, not, not easily found. Um, so I just want to add on that the, the modules actually came after an idea in ES4, which was packages. So um, this is actually like the third iteration of trying to get a module system into JavaScript. And we're even back at that archived page. <laughs> so if we take a look at where modules originally landed, it landed in um, ECMA 2015, also known as ES6. Um, here's the section on modules, it's section 15.2, goes through the syntax, and then, you know, we'll have other stuff in here uh, around imports and exports and um, the general semantics of it. Um, it was only until more recently that these have actually been implemented. Um, the implementation of modules in ES6 is particularly interesting because it is one of, um, you know, the proposals that happened prior to the current TC39 process, um, which actually is probably a good, a good thing to go over quickly, which is kind of like how do things get ratified by the TC39? Um, does anyone have the link to the stages handy right now? Oh, I can get the procedure stock, you mean? Yeah, could you just post that in the chat really quickly? I'd like to throw that on the screen. One second, I didn't have it. Like Ready. We can just kind of talk. So there are a number of different stages that come through with, um, now. Oh, here we go. The, the table of death. Yeah. So, so this kind of outlines how a feature gets promoted through the TC39 now and um, modules predate this process and the requirements of it. Um, these requirements are kind of, you know, changing in time as things move through. Um, and anyone else who's participated in TC39, please feel free to interrupt me if I'm incorrect there. But while, you know, we have entrance criteria and acceptance uh, signifies, like these are kind of not hard, super hard written laws and on a per spec basis, um, you know, entrance criteria may be considered higher 
um, and a little flexible. But these specific criteria generally tend to be met. Um, but through the whole process, there's a need for consensus without any dissent within the entire room of the TC39, which can you know take time to get buy-in. Um, so at stage zero, anything can kind of be brought at stage zero. It's a straw man. It doesn't require any uh, commitments by anyone for it to reach there. Um, to reach stage one, you'll have a champion identified and something outlining the, the problem space, as well as like a high level API. Um, generally, there'll be a discussion around algorithms and ways that the implementation will be approached as well as an outline of the potential cross-cutting concerns that may happen over time as it's implemented. At this stage, to reach this stage, there's no need for spec text. Um, and generally it's a signal that it is, you know, a specification that the committee is interested in exploring. It's not a commitment that is going to be implemented or shipped, but it is a commitment that the committee will explore the, the space. Um, to reach stage two, it is usually um, when you have everything that's been identified in one, but also some initial spec text. Um, this text does not need to be necessarily reviewed or it does not need to be completed or perfect. Um, but generally things will not be brought into stage two if there's not consensus around the approach of the spec text. To reach the third stage, which is- uh, Wait, Miles, I just wanted to cut in real quick. Yes, please. So to clarify just slightly, uh, so stage one means the committee is committing to exploring the problem, but as you said, not committing to solving it or committing to any solution or anything like that. Stage two means that the committee is uh, committed to the general shape of the solution that it has, it has in mind to solve that problem. So generally, like when it hits stage two, that is the rough direction that the solution will take. Uh, in other words, it's like, but it's but it's explicitly a commitment that the problem will be solved in the language, and then it's a slightly looser commitment that this is how we're going to solve it. Excellent. More or less. Thank you. And and I guess one thing to add to that is as things go through this process and reach different stages, problems in the implementation and in assumptions may arise. And it may have to move down through the process or iterate through the process in order to move forward. Um, so for stage three, um, more or less the spec text needs to be completed and needs to be um, have reviewers who are designated to review it who sign it off on the spec. And the ECMAScript editor needs to sign off on the current spec as well. I think there's currently work being done on coming up with kind of an editor team around this. I believe Brad and Jordan are both part of this and maybe you can talk to how that's gonna modify the stage three. I can- um, Go ahead, Bradley. Sure. Uh, so we're both becoming co-editors, um, which is a little bit new to TC39. Um, the editor work is a lot of background work and making sure that everything makes sense as a whole. Uh, so when we're going for stage three, we have ec markup documents prepared, which is the syntax that is compiled to the spec. And we're probably going to be a little more formal. We're starting to standardize some terminology and this format of things that we haven't had a process document for in the past. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Bradley. So for something to then reach stage four, and stage four means that it's finished, it's in the spec, it is officially part of the language. You need to have the spec text completed as above. You need to have test 262 acceptance tests um, written in, in usage for the scenario and merged into the test 262 suite. You need to have two compatible implementations which pass the acceptance tests. And this is like in, um, like in Chrome or in Edge or in you know similar. Well, can I talk a little more about that specific requirement? Yes, please. So this pretty much, even though like as Miles mentioned earlier, uh, some of these entrance criteria, criteria may be uh, flexible depending on case by case, 
Uh, generally, everyone is pretty consistently in agreement on strictly adhering to all of them, um, more, you know, more or less. This one in particular is the one that's controversial, uh, which is why it has the, the kind of hand wavy language of such as that provided by uh, two independent VMs. I'm, so I'm, I'm reading the next criteria um, mm -hmm. as well. But the um, so the there are some proposals that have uh, that tend, so for example, proposals that have web compatibility risk, uh, there's a lot of resistance to moving them to stage four until two web browsers have shipped them, ideally not behind a flag so that the widest number of possible websites and users can have experienced them. Um, but for things that there is little to no web compatibility risk, the committee has often been comfortable with one browser behind a flag plus Babel and polyfill. So the, the kind of exact requirements change, uh, but there's definitely not consensus about what that requirement means. Um, there's like, I have an open PR that's my first attempt to try and clarify this a bit, but um, the what, what that basically means for people looking at a proposal is that if it is in two unflagged web browsers, like Edge or Firefox or Chrome or Safari, um, then it definitely meets this criteria. No one will debate that. Um, it's it's just that there there may be proposals that can meet this criteria with lesser implementations. Awesome, thank you. Um, and so once all those criteria have been met, a pull request can be sent to the actual spec itself to land the spec text changes, and the ECMAScript editor signs off on that, and it will then be included in the next official um, draft, uh, official, would it be considered a draft of ECMA 262 or publication? Oh, that's gonna be publication. The draft is the thing that it lands in before mm -hmm. we actually push it out every year. One thing that I think is worth noting, and again, please correct me if I'm off on this assumption. Um, a lot of people from the committee view the spec at this point as kind of a living text. And while we still on a yearly basis sign off on a new version of it, um, the GitHub repo is, is generally considered to be a source of truth. And it's more of a living document rather than a yearly versioned document. Um, to an extent, yes. There, there are sometimes minor changes that happen still to the spec. Mm -hmm. and, and that can happen after the yearly publication as well. So um, the, uh, I, I would generally say that there are, uh, there are some implementations that will only consider it in the language uh, and ship it unflagged when it has landed in a yearly publication. And then there are other implementations that consider it in the language the instant it hits the master branch on GitHub. Um, the you know, so there's not clear consensus on, on how to view it, um, but there is certainly many folks who would like to look, view it as a living standard and uh, assume that anything in the repo is what's in the language. And I'll, I'll and, just add to that, that once it lands in the main repo, it is extremely hard to change. Um, it is, uh, we have gone several times and discuss things prior uh, about changing existing text. And if something is shipped in web browsers, it's now web compact concern, and it's unlikely that we'll be able to make much progress. OK, um, so let's move on to, uh, out of the process and get back to the issue at hand in the history. Um, so we went through, we were talking about how it was introduced in ES6. One of the things that is worth mentioning is that the loader itself was not specified. So at this point, um, the loader is implemented by embedders. Um, so you have the loader that's implemented inside of Blink or inside of a variety of different um, different VMs, uh, as well as the loader that's implemented inside of Node. Uh, the lack of standardization here um, can make it tricky. It, it 
enforces us to make decisions, for example, about whether or not certain things are synchronous or not. Um, there was attempts to load it in the what working group. Um, and you could see the repo here is what big loader, um, but a good chunk is outdated and it's currently stalled. Um, Guy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to mention there was actually a very short phase in which a loader, which later became the Wattwork loader spec, was actually drafted into an early draft of ES 2015. And if you're interested, I do actually have a link to this initial draft of work Jason Orendorf did in collaboration with David Herman and co, uh, where they actually drafted in a uh, load of hooks into ES 2015 and that didn't kind of work out. So that was kind of abandoned and then became the Wattwog Lotus spec. So if it's an interesting piece of history, I can share that link as well. Yes, please do. That would be great to have um, for the sake of consistency. So the next thing that we can talk about really quickly is pragmas. So there was a proposal that made it to stage one for a pragma specifically use module. Um, this was specifically to have an in-band way of determining whether or not a particular um, source file is a module or not. Um, currently in the implementation, the only way to tell whether or not something is a module is done via mind types and context of where it's being loaded from, which becomes kind of ambiguous when you're in Node, um, especially if you're trying to tell the difference between an ESM and a common JS module, for example. Um, so this proposal went to the committee. Um, there was, um, you know, different presentations. It was rejected by the committee um, for a number of reasons. Um, was anyone who were, was at those meetings able to add a little bit more context to that? Um, I can speak to it. Uh, I think the biggest pushback was around that you would have to add something to your source text to declare it a ES module. Um, so that meant that you don't know its mode before you start parsing it, which browsers didn't like. And there's also just a cultural resistance to pragmas unless there is a extreme case for them, which I guess is not considered as extreme as some. So also one use case that if, if you think, when, when I've thought it through, it's kind of explained the resistance to a lot of these module proposals. Uh, a use case that some of the folks on the committee seem to find valuable is that as you begin to type JavaScript code directly into like a script block in a browser, um, they didn't want that to suddenly change the parsing goal as you type things. So for example, they didn't want it to always be a script and then you type import or export and suddenly it's a module or they didn't want like suddenly as you type use module, it changes the parse goal, or if you delete it, it changes back to script and things like that. So they, the, their, the, the use case there that they wanted to protect was um, that the parse goal should remain consistent as you type from nothing to like all the way along to the path to your completed script. Uh, and that requires an out of band mechanism. So one thing that I think is worth mentioning and then Please correct me if I'm off on this. It seemed to me that some of the recommendations around this were that embedders could still choose to implement pragmas if they wanted to. And if it showed that it was something that was being in being implemented in wide use in the ecosystem, it could be revisited. Um, but I think that part of our decision to not move forward with it was that we didn't want to um, do anything that was inconsistent with the rest of the ecosystem. Um, but I, it is something that maybe it, we could re-examine um, because as far as I am personally concerned, the use module pragma, if it exists in code, that would just run in the browser and kind of not be executed. It would just essentially be dead weight for browser code, but could be a pragma that has meaning in Node. Um, but I don't know if we want to create that inconsistency in our environment. So I, 
I will state it would be very hard to get this through TC39. So even if we revisit it, I don't think it would make it through TC39. This would need to just be on node. Because the it's exactly what you stated. It would be a difference with web browsers and TC39 is not interested in uh, having one hosting environment prioritized over the other, really. Yeah, and, and to what Jeremiah just said in the chat was that uh, some of those concerns from the browsers could be concerns for us as well. I do think one of the things that's worth keeping in mind with standards though is um, a lot of those standards, you could, like, you could think about the standards driving the language, but the language can also drive the standards. So, um, I mean, it's generally best practice to try to do it through the standards to make sure everyone's on board and everyone has a chance to um, participate in things. But, you know, if something's picked up by the ecosystem and is, you know, a de facto standard from usage, that is a, a solid reason for the committee to consider making normative text around it. Um, so we do have, if anyone could, could kind of help me with just removing those straight throughs. I don't know how, how those got there. We do have these notes right here on, you know, how the pragma was added in the discussion around the pragma happening or not happening, as well as the slide deck. So if you want to see more about that, um, please feel free to dig in there. The next thing that we have up here is unambiguous grammar. Um, Brad, was that one that you that you added? Yeah, so I presented this a while ago and I, I was coming to the committee already being blocked by committee members. Uh, so it was a little bit depressing and emotional. Um, it's It covers pretty much the same reasoning as we just did. Browsers don't want uh, to parse out the goal of a source text. Um, there are also some concerns with copy pasting with this one because unlike the pragma, this could exist anywhere in a source text. So if it's at the last line of a 400 kilobyte file, some people didn't like that it's not in a specific location. Um, so yeah, the basic idea was you could detect if there is an import or an export a static statement and swap the mode from script to module if it exists. Uh, it effectively uh, forbids ES modules from existing without an import or export statement, but you can kind of work around this by making an export curly curly statement, which doesn't actually export anything. So yeah, that's the thing. So this is, this is kind of in line with some conversations that have come up in the past and actually more recently around why doesn't Node just dual parse um, in, in our loader. And it is possible that we could explore dual parsing and look at performance, um, but this is kind of prior art on the committee not being interested in dual parsing, you know, kind of being an explicit part of the specification itself. Is that is that a fair way to summarize it, Brad? I'm I'm a little bit cautious about your wording. We can look into things. We can look into almost anything. We have a mm -hmm. Turing complete system. Um, so I don't know how to take that. It's also, also the the committee doesn't want it. Like I would also say that having something where script will for all eternity be the default and you basically always get a script if you start a file. Just like, I like that strict mode is not the default and I would much rather move towards a world where strict mode by default is the actual default. You don't have to remember to write export curly to get strict mode. Yeah, that was another uh, common concern as well is that people in general on the committee on T39 did not want uh, what they perceived as a tax on people writing modules for the infinite future. So um, th that's, for example, why modules have and class bodies ha are automatically in strict mode because they're trying to they're trying to get rid of that tax of having to remember to write use strict. And so similarly, 
having to remember to type an import and export statement or having to remember to type use module is felt like uh, to many people like a tax that um, that they didn't want to burden future JavaScript developers with forever. That seems reasonable. Now, now, just a, a, a question: If you're if something like this only applied within the module goal and assumed ESM first with a fallback to to script, I guess that doesn't really make sense, right? Because you'd never want to be importing script. Anyways, we don't need to dig too far into this one. It did not move forward. Um, the next one that we have on here is dynamic module reform. Um, and then, uh, Guy, to your uh, point with covering top level of weight, um, I'll try to leave 15 minutes specifically for that. Um, so this is a pro this is a proposal by Carity uh, to, to, reform, to reform the spec to preserve the order of execution for dynamic uh, modules. Um, I believe that the intention of this was to allow it um, that if you use dynamic import at all throughout your um, throughout your graph, that module order would be preserved uh, to allow some similar programming models to node. Um, does anyone have a little bit of extra context so, to add to this? Um, we we kind of talked about this topic earlier about how when you are importing common JS, you don't know its shape. This was also seeking to relax the goal of having your linking be statically known and cause errors if it fails until you get to the evaluation phase. So uh, that would let you get named exports from common JS. Okay, awesome. So this was not moved forward. Um, I don't think we need to dig too much more into this right now, but you know, um, I think it's a good thing to have in here in prior art to look at, um, especially kind of when we're considering how we came up with the decisions that we're at right now. Um, module import options. Um, you skipped the one. Pardon? You skipped, oh, I skipped the one. one. Um, oh, nested imports. So considering that this is built on top of Rayify and I see Ben is on here. Ben, are you still on the call? Yeah, I'm here. Would you like to describe this one? Yeah, uh, totally. Um, so I guess this was two years ago now uh, that I proposed allowing import declarations that aren't just at the top level of modules um, in the same way that common JS require can be nested. Um, at the time, my, my view was that this ability to nest require calls was one of the few remaining advantages of common JS over ECMAScript modules. And so I wanted to close that gap by uh, giving the same power to import declarations so that you can like, you know, import something into a certain scope rather than sort of globally within your module or put an import declaration in a try catch block in case you are going to, you know, try importing from multiple different modules and you don't know which one is going to succeed on a, on a certain platform. Um, and I, I mean, I, other languages have this, but other languages don't have all the same constraints as JavaScript, especially the, the whole loading in the browser and fetching modules asynchronously thing. Um, so I think the, the high bit here is that, um, if, if you could put an import declaration, like inside of a conditional block, um, when execution reached that point, it would have to uh, sort of evaluate that module synchronously because it just looks like a, a statement, basically. Um, and that implication of synchronous module evaluation is at odds with other ideas like top level await. Um, and so the, the committee, and I agree with this, uh, didn't want to commit to something that would constrain module evaluation semantics uh, in the future. Um, if this were to be revived, it would need to have explicit uh, semantics about what happens if you 
try to import a module whose evaluation is asynchronous, which is not something that currently exists, but it could exist in the future. Um, I guess you would want to throw in that case. And also what happens if the uh, source of the module is not immediately available because you would have to fetch it over the network. Um, I was imagining this feature would be used in the context of uh, uh, a bundling tool where you, you would have some other way of making sure that the code was available. And so it would be safe to import it. Um, so yeah, that's that's the current status. Uh, it, if, if it were possible, I still think it would improve um, the ergonomics of, of modules, but um, it, you know, it, it becomes more problematic. And since the original proposal, uh, the dynamic import uh, proposal has taken off and it certainly solves some of the use cases of this. Um, however, dynamic import um, uh, sacrifices some of the like static analyzability benefits of static import declarations. So for example, it's harder to do tree shaking if you're making heavy use of dynamic imports. Um, and also if you destructure the properties of the namespace object, those variables that you're declaring won't be live bound in the way that symbols imported with an import declaration would be. Um, so I'm still looking for ways to you know, improve those aspects of dynamic import so that it can be a full replacement for this nested import idea. Um, but I, I think there's a, a low probability of uh, proposing nested imports again in exactly the same form. It would uh, be more about like borrowing those ideas and making sure that uh, they're achievable with dynamic imports or something like that. Uh, just a stupid question because it's the first time that I'm seeing the proposal. Um, would something like turning it into an await a import statement, so basically an import statement that can only appear in an ASIC context and is co-opting the await keyword, just like for await off? Yeah, uh, that's an idea. Um, there's, there's even a thought that um, <laughs> if you imagine a future with top level await, um, you could you could also imagine that import declarations are allowed wherever the await expression is allowed. So that's you know obviously the the top level of modules, or uh, in the body of async functions. So uh, if you could write an async function that had nested imports inside of it, that that would actually address a lot of these use cases. Um, I guess it's it's an open question whether there would need to be a special uh, await keyword syntax for that, um, and it's it's also uh, sort of tricky to think about like whether multiple nested imports await imports would uh, evaluate in in parallel or in series. Sort of some of the same questions that we have with with top level await in general. But yeah, it's definitely a um, area for future exploration. Cool. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, moving on, um, we've got a whole bunch and we wanted to spend some time on top level of weight, so we may go a little quicker on these. Uh, module import options. So I'm not super familiar with this one. Um, so this is basically being able to pass in things like sub resource integrity parameters uh, to module importing. Um, it's a little bit of a hard design space uh, because it has to be primitives like strings or just statically parsable. So, yeah. Okay, that makes it that makes sense. And would those would those be hosted on import.meta? Uh, no, they're not hosted on anything. They're when you import, you provide them somehow so that the host can do code sign checks and things like that. Okay. Um, import ordering clarification. Um, this is from the notes. Um, Brad, do you want to talk about this one very briefly? Ooh, um, so this is actually pretty much the first time we had a big presentation about CommonJS integrating with ESM at TC39. It's a couple years old. Um, it just goes over the exact nature of the two different things. Um, there's not a proposal here. It's just an explainer text. 
but it's the first big presentation at TC39. Awesome. Um, Import.meta, um, I believe, is Import.meta stage four at this point? It's not unflagged. I think uh, it's still three. Okay, yeah. it's still stage three. Um, Import.meta acts as a meta property uh, within the module for you to store um, like, like SCLU scoped information. So kind of similarly how, to how node modules are wrapped in, um, in a Lambda and within that we lexically scope stuff like dir name and file name and require and module and exports. Uh, this is a mechanism for you know, embedders to do the same thing, um, but with an official API. So this is where we have um, currently in our implementation, we have import.meta URL. Um, and it's somewhere that we're thinking about putting require. Um, Gus has added to the chat that import meta URL is specified by the what working group as far as he knows, which is uh, you know, a good, interesting extra bit of context. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's something that's moving forward. I, I don't see anything blocking that moving to stage four. Um, and it has um, launched, I think, not behind a flag in Chrome, but I could be mistaken on that. Um, for the sake of time, um, Brad, do you have a really quick one for multi-module grammar? Sure, you... I'll give you like the 30 second overview. Uh, this is basically a way to declare module blocks. So um, basically you'll have the keyword module, then a string for the specifier and then curly braces. And it's a way to essentially make bundles in JS and they will override the outer source text uh, module resolution algorithm. That's it. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Um, and then before we quickly get into top level eight, uh, Justin, I'm noticing that we didn't get the text in um, for your proposal. For it's at the AC bottom of top level eight. Where is it? Down, down the last bullet point. Yeah, inline module. Oh, okay, the issue. Okay, great. So top level await um, is a proposal that I've put together um, about the idea of being able to use await outside of an async function. Currently, if you want to use the await keyword, you're limited to doing so in an async function. Um, we're seeing quite a lot of top level mains to allow this kind of syntax as well as um, immediately invoked async function expressions. Uh, like we'll see this pattern right here. There's concern that like with this pattern, we're actually losing um, some of, you know, the static and the static analyzability of modules, but also the ability of knowing that that execution is happening happening in a deterministic order. If your modules have everything inside of an async function, we have no way of knowing the order that things are being executed. Um, top level await would be something that could be statically analyzed and essentially while it may dirty the tree, depending on how it's implemented, you would at least know the portion of the tree that's affected by this. Um, you also have like kind of this pattern of completely dynamic modules where um, in order to await async exports, um, you're kind of seeing stuff like this. So. There were three proposed solutions. Um, the first would be that the top level await blocks tree execution. Um, tree execution is something that is distinct from a, the uh, event loop execution. So the event loop would continue to execute, but the idea would be that, that once you are going through the graph and you hit top level await, the tree would no longer execute until that await had resolved. And here's an example of you know, if you were to import these three modules that all have top level await in them, um, the execution order would be the same as the syntax that we're doing right now. Um, a second solution that was offered was top level await not blocking sibling execution, which essentially means when a parent module imports a module that has a top level await, that it will continue executing siblings um, and siblings would continue to execute until they in turn hit a top level await. Um, so you could see that's kind of the difference between awaiting promise.all and awaiting each independently. So in this case, all three of these imports would, would 
ex execute synchronously up and until the point um, that an await was hit, at which point it would move to executing the next module. Um, this we believe can be designed in a way that can also like avoid deadlocks and cycles and we'll get to that uh, later. Um, a third variant that was discussed was top level await only being able to be used in modules without exports. Um, the idea here being that um, some of the biggest pushback around top level await was in, you know, modules deep in your graph blocking the thread or in um, creating deadlock in circular references. And so with many, since many of the use cases for top level await are kind of happening, happening at the like root node of the tree, um, top level await being only, only being able to be used in modules with that exports would create a limited scope of where it can be used, which solves, you know, some of the concerns. Um, we have a number of different illustrative examples in here of where it could be used. We have a discussion about like, you know, whether or not it's a foot gun and some of the concerns from um, halting proc progress, which, you know, there are already ways to halt progress, um, deadlock and, you know, how this could potentially be solved via temporal dead zone, which if people have questions about, Brad could definitely add more context to. Um, there is a deck, which I don't have access to right now that I can add um, some more links to. There's a repo that Brad has just about collecting kind of talking points around it. And um, there are some alternative proposals as well, um, such as this one right here, um, async inline modules. Um, Justin, do you want to take a second to go over this? We may have lost Justin. We have lost Justin since, since, uh, since this started. Um, but essentially, uh, my high level idea, my high level understanding of async, um, of async blocks, async inline modules would be that at the top of your uh, module, you could import from async and essentially all of these async blocks across all of the modules in your tree would execute before the rest of the tree executed. Um, and in turn, everything that was imported, all those symbols would be available um, within the rest of the tree um, as if they had just been imported normally. Um, I believe one of the biggest use cases for this is around the like, component libraries where variant A from the top level await proposal creates a risk for shallow but wide graphs that you may experience, you know, like delay or block on the draw of each component as you're having to make a network request and wait for that network request to, to finish. There wouldn't be a way to paralyze that. So variant B is an, a, is an attempt to try to solve that particular problem where um, modules that are not connected, um, that are siblings continue to execute. So in the case of a component library, you know, you could start loading all the components um, in parallel um, this alternative approach is interesting um, as another way uh, to think about it. Um, some of the conversations that Justin and I have had have been around the fact that this introduces a novel use case specifically in kind of thinking about a pre-processing step before the rest of your tree executes. Um, but I don't think that async, um, async inline modules solve for all of the cases of what people want to do with top level await and vice versa. I don't think top level await necessarily solves all the cases for async inline modules. So I think that there's an opportunity um, to potentially explore both of these proposals, but it's definitely, and this is something that's come up in the TC39 recently, um, you know, individual proposals as standalones can be great, but when you start looking at a collection of proposals and how they affect each other, it really creates a different story. So I think it is important for us to kind of look at these together and see, you know, how they affect each other and how they they change um, each other. Um, you know, one thing, one thing that I had suggested, uh, kind of jokingly, as a potential variant D, would be implementing um, async inline modules and hoisting any top level awaits into one. Um, but I, I think that would be too weird and confusing. But uh, just an example of how we can consider these two proposals interacting. 
Um, does anyone have any questions or, or thoughts around top level of weight right now? Let's kind of time at 11 April. And Who's talking right now? You're very low. Um, since no one else is talking, Guy, you have your hand up if you'd like to add anything. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify uh, around the uh, synchronous execution. So is the idea that uh, like within the synchronous subgraphs, you would maintain perfect synchronous execution and it would just be the actual modules that, that have top level awaits that cause those kind of boundaries. Are you talking about for variant A or variant B? Uh, for all the variants for how the execution behaves, um, I guess, yeah, variant B, uh, does have differences as well in terms of how you define the synchronous subgraph, but um, yeah. Oh, yeah. are you talking about like the subgraph of using a dynamic import? So the, the simplest example would be if I have no use of top level of eight, um, yes. my module graph would execute completely synchronously, right? Yes. Uh, and then if a top level of eight module were to import a module graph that has no top level of eight, it won't change that at all. So you, you kind of get those, you keep those clusters of synchronicity as it were. Yes. And then the, the idea with variant A is that that synchronicity is unaffected. So the execution order of the module graph would be unchanged by top right. level of weight, which in turn would block the tree execution. And variant B is the one that would actually introduce indeterminism into the execution of the module tree by allowing siblings to execute. But the primary assumption being that, you know, cycles would in turn, or, or like circular references would in turn lock awaiting, like waiting for the other awaits to resolve. Um, and in turn, the graph would execute in a way that would not be inconsistent. Part of the thinking there is that, you know, if people are looking to use top level await anyways, they're likely to put things into an, an async block and that async block would essentially have the same behavior with less determinism. Um, so variant B would essentially allow people to do more or less what they're doing today, but in a way that's easier to statically analyze and less likely um, to promote um, you know, this, this kind of programming style. Um, Gil? Yes, just to understand. So theoretically, if I have top level await, I can do some top level await uh, um, stuff, get a value back, and then export default that value. So the whole export is waiting on, on that top level await, right? Yes. Um, and a question. module, a module would always block a, a module that's awaiting a top level input, like awaiting a top level anything will always block its parents execution. Great. So, so it's much, much more powerful than an async uh, IAFE. Yes. And, and the second question, when you're saying top level, let's say I, I await something, but then I decided I want to put it in a function that is, is synchronous. I, I can't do that. I have to put that in a function that is async. So top level await means top level on the module level. From all the discussions that we've had so far, it is top level on the module level. It would only work inside of async functions. Um, okay. As far as I know, makes no sense. one has discussed, um, you know, being able to put it in a synchronous function. Right. Um, it makes total sense. Thanks. So as a clarification, I think that the primary use case for this is so that um, where where your uh, async um, execution tree goes to the top, you don't for like all your async awaits, you don't need to have a uh, like a promise and then runner sort of deal. Yeah, exactly. So it would simplify some of that. And um, one of the things that also it adds, which um, Gil was hinting at, is there isn't currently anything that we have in the language that essentially allows you to say, stop executing my parent until something happens. And so that extra bit of granular control um, does help a lot with, you know, programming patterns that we that we're using in node right now. So I'm not um, actually I, okay. I'm not actually sure, sure that statement's true because as I found out recently, you can actually block from um, the atomic uh, global variable and do some very strange things there. Right. So I'll you can it. block on a promise. You can block on promise. So I'll, I'll reframe it, Jeremiah. It, it adds it in a way 
that is coherent and easy to teach. Um, Guy? Uh, I, I wouldn't waste time, don't worry. It's okay, we still have three minutes in, until our larger break, so if you have anything to add. Yeah, I, I think it was already mentioned, just, just to say that it's, it's something that effectively we do in Node with those sort of if, if production load A, if development load B. Um, and so there are a bunch of patterns around it, not just the top level scripts um, use case. Mm -hmm. uh, and that. we do have a couple different potential use cases in here from dynamic uh, dependency pathing to resource initialization to dependency fallbacks. And if anyone has more uh, novel use cases, please feel free to open a pull request against the proposal. I would really appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, each event is ordered and wrong. Uh, I definitely had, I already opened it as an issue on the repository, but I wanted to add the polyfill use case because <laughs> it seems like a relatively important one. So where you dynamically load a bunch of dependencies based on the presence of globals and then you polyfill globals, which would also present a problem, I think, for most of the variants other than A, right? Because if you want to load a polyfill first and then execute siblings most likely because the siblings wouldn't have the polyfill in their dependency graph that would be an issue for variant b and following mm -hmm. um, and i think if i'm not mistaken um i don't know if jordan's still on the call but that's one of jordan's concerns um with the current proposal yeah that is definitely one of my concerns um I, I'll have to take another look at top level await and chat with Miles offline. But uh, as I recall, we had come up with a sort of like C or D or something that would have been compatible with polyfill uh, approaches. But anyway, we can talk about that in a separate context. Okay, excellent. So, so we're at one o'clock now. Um, Did we get the last question in the queue? Oh, I, I was actually not looking at the queue. So please. Um, so Jan was asking. Yeah, basically, basically, the thing I just talked about, I just pulled it out. Okay. Sure. All right, that's it. So hold on, we've got some questions in the YouTube before we go on break. Jeffrey asks, when the TC39 committee rejected these various options, those rejections were in isolation, right? If all these options were put on the table today, I wonder it, what they would pick as the least bad option? Um, I don't know, but I don't think adding more options is generally appealing because we already have a language complexity concern at TC39. So the more things well, you add, the harder it starts to become. But also unless a majority of implementations are forcing one of those options, uh, then one of the options that is always on the table is do nothing, leave everything as is. Uh, and that will probably always be the least bad option uh, if, if they're all, all considered bad. 